All right, so now I'd like to introduce Tony and Alex. Um, Tony Rasmanian is a clinical faculty at the University of Washington and has a private practice in Seattle. And Alex Bass is a clinical psychologist and teacher and researcher at ISP University Institute in Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, they are co-founders of Deliberate Practice Institute and provide workshops, webinars, and advanced clinical training all over the world. And now they are co-editing American Psychological Association's upcoming book series on the essentials of deliberate practice. And uh, Alex is also a founder of host of the psychotherapist, Psychotherapy Expert Talks, um, which is a series of interviews with distinguished psychotherapists and the therapy researchers and available on YouTube. Um, I personally think deliberate practice holds a key to understanding how therapists learn and become better therapists. Now, I will now uh, give a button to Tony and Alex. Well, thank you so much for being here with us and then welcome to the webinar series as the very first presenters. Mm. I'm going to hide myself as well. So, Tony and Alex, there you go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shigeru. Thank, thank you for being here. Oh, it's really lovely. Thank you. Um, I mean, this is really a huge pleasure. I think I, I consider, at least for myself, SEPI like a, a real home. So this is so great that we have a chance to share all the things we're excited about uh, at this stage. And yeah, like uh, Shigeru and Tracy were saying, this is going to be kind of interactive. So not the purely, in the true spirit of the little practice, not a purely didactic presentation. So I hope you'll join us in some of the actual workout that we'll be trying out later. And Tony will be uh, chief in the dual practice exercise section. I'll bore you first with the actual principles of the little practice. So Tony, I'm not sure if you want to just say something before we move ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, Shigeru and Tracy, for having us. It's a great honor to, uh, to be here with Seppi. Um, and for everyone who hasn't done so already, uh, please enter your uh, name and location in the Q&A. So not that the chat is for like technical challenges or, you know, that kind of stuff. Q&A is for questions for us. And because there's two of us, we uh, can engage your questions or at least you know, collect your questions while the presentation is going on. So if you have any questions while either of us is talking, while anything is going on, just please type it in uh, and we'll save it and we'll then we'll answer questions at certain portions as we go. It's so cool just seeing so many people from around the world. I want to thank also Shigeru that it's like almost six in the morning in Japan. Yeah. It's almost midnight in Portugal. <laughs> and what time is it there, Tony? Oh, let's see here, 3 p.m. We we cover the whole clock. Exactly, so this is a true integrated presentation yeah. around the world. <laughs> so without further ado, let me share my screen here. And maybe Tony, you can just give me the okay that you are actually seeing this. Yeah, it looks great. Awesome. So everyone, we've been very fortunate to be working with a lot of you know, actual colleagues uh, and a lot of them are actually very prominent also at CEPI who have been helping us with this book series and Tony and I have been working kind of around the clock, uh, finding better ways to do research and promote uh, practices in the little practice. So the first thing I'll do is just give you a sense of what the little practice is and how it actually can apply to psychotherapy training and supervision. Um, and, you know, part of what we're going to talk about is based on this book series. Like uh, Shigeru was saying, we're doing a, a rather ambitious project uh, where we have a series of books for specific models. Um, and in, and we're collaborating with, you know, very wonderful people, each from the specific model to create specific deliberate practice exercises that would help in really, uh, aiding in the skill development of trainees in the specific models. So that's something that will hopefully start coming out during late this year or early next year. So I guess the one place to start is why is this even relevant? Why would the little practice be uh, important, let's say, to our field? The little practice has a term and has a research program 
did not start in psychotherapy. So it started actually from a, a psychologist, Kay Anders Ericsson, but he studied very many different professional fields to find out how people actually got better in those fields and what made uh, experts be who they are. And in our own field, it's interesting because research on skill development and improving effectiveness, clinical effectiveness over time, has been kind of a controversial topic. First of all, it's really hard to research on the topic. So every day that I'm just very briefly going to show you has to be taken with a grain of salt. That's really the most important thing to say at bat. But I guess one place to start is with the question, do therapists improve over time? And the answer is a resounding and very courageous, not reliably, or at least it varies a lot, right? So here's one example from our friend Simon Goldberg at Wisconsin Madison. They did a big study, longitudinal study, uh, following therapist outcomes uh, over up to 18 years. And they found huge variability in which some therapists did get reliably better over time. So as they had more years of experience in practice, they did help more reliably more of their clients. But some other therapists had the exact opposite, unfortunately, meaning that they actually slightly deteriorated in their clinical effectiveness over time. Now, I must say that this is a little bit maybe of a taboo kind of subject because all of us, of course, want to get better over time. And without being overly uh, pessimistic, actually, it seems that on average, we can't really say that people, that therapists really do get more effective in and of itself if you just look at years of experience. So this is an important takeaway, is actually if you just look at the years of experience that the clinician has been practicing, that really doesn't tell you a lot about how effective that clinician is, right? Now, we could go a lot into the kind of research, you know, with my students, I call these free books here, you might recognize some of them or all of them, the research Bibles. Uh, for psychotherapy uh, and actually our friends you know Michael Amber, John Norcross, Bruce Lampard are all friends of CEPI and the bottom line when you accumulate over 50 years of research is that actually five to nine percent of variability in outcomes is due to therapists so meaning the individual therapist besides his or her specific model being used Five to nine percent is actually quite a big percentage. It's much bigger than the effect sizes we find across different models or specific techniques. So basically what we're saying is who you're seeing or who the specific therapist is really matters. And sometimes it does matter quite dramatically. So there's some interesting research from Michael Lambert, for example, that the most effective therapist can produce up to 10 times more clinical significant change. Now, of course, since life a lot of the times uh, exists according to a bell curve, that unfortunately means that there's also a fair amount of therapists who unfortunately are not helping so reliably their clients. So th this uh, finding that's been somewhat reliable also is that there is really no straight correlation between the therapist's years of experience or level of experience and their clinical effectiveness. So if you put it, if you do a thought experiment, let's imagine you by yourself actually go see a therapist for your own personal process. We can ask ourselves, why would a therapist with 40 years of experience be necessarily better, better suited for you than the therapist with 20 years of experience, right? So actually, when we look at it at the case by case level, it makes a lot of sense that years of experience in and of itself would not be correlating with clinical outcomes, which is indeed what we find across studies. Another interesting, if controversial finding is that non-supervised therapists don't seem to be reliably more effective or produce better therapeutic alliances than supervised therapists. Now, of course, there, we're simplifying reality here to the maximum because, of course, this is, again, a complex topic. Research is quite hard to do here. But this is just to say that if we just know that this therapist has been supervised, that tells us really very little about how much better or more effective that therapist is compared to the non-supervised therapist. And finally, and I'm really kind of summarizing here a lot of research, paraprofessionals a lot of the times, or sometimes at least, don't seem to be much less effective than those that have actual clinical training. Again, 
uh, more, a lot more research needs to be done. There's a lot to be said about this. But the main point here is that we actually have a, a certain problem in our field regarding how do therapists get more effective over time? Because some of them do get more reliably better over time. It's just hard to really pinpoint what distinguishes the people that year across year seem to be getting more effective as therapists. Uh, in this handbook of psychotherapy and behavior change edited by Mike Lambert, uh, there's a wonderful review chapter by Clara Hill on training and supervision effects. If you're really interested in this kind of research, I would recommend you going there. So this is, let's say, the problem. Now, it's very interesting because we might think that these findings are rather controversial in our field, but to deliberate practice researchers, they are actually uh, not surprising. So the idea that your level of experience, your years of experience as a professional does not correlate with how effective you are as a professional is something that uh, deliberate practice researchers have been finding over and over again in different professional fields. So deliberate practice was a term and a research program started over 30 years ago. So a lot of research actually has been uh, happening over the last 30 years. Main first research was Kay Anders Ericsson. Now there's a whole, you know, across the world, bunch of researchers doing research on deliberate practice in different professional fields. But what they found essentially is that if you're into a sport, if you're playing music, if you're a surgeon, if you play chess, across all of these fields, if you simply ask how long have you been doing it, how many years of experience do you have, that does not necessarily correlate with how good you are or how effective you are at doing it. So what we're seeing is that the findings that we're getting out of psychotherapy research are actually very much in, uh, at par the same with what seems to be happening in other fields or what seems to happen in other fields. Now, this book here on the left is kind of the academic, you know, handbook in case you want to really delve into the research. And this book on the right is a very nice read uh, for more kind of lay people. And I would actually recommend both. But this book on the right, if you're really interested on just the basic research on the little practice, is a wonderful read to get to know it. Now, what these researchers found early on is that it's very easy for us as professionals to get into what these researchers called arrested development. Now what this is, is as you're trying to get better at any skill, and let's imagine that I want to get better at playing piano, for example, I have a parallel life as a musician, so that it's close to my heart giving uh, examples uh, related to music. If you're trying to get better at piano, it's quite easy for you to get somewhat better at first by yourself, but very quickly you reach a peak or a plateau that's called arrested development. This has been found also across professions, meaning it's easy at first when you're doing it by yourself and getting some initial feedback to really get some skill development going, but it's very easy to then stagnate after you know, a few months, a few years. Now, what these researchers found is that there was a subgroup of people, of professionals, that actually continued beyond the rest of development and actually got steadily better over time. And they reached what you can call expert performance. So they actually got mastery, increased mastery over time in their chosen profession. So, of course, you know, Anders Ericsson and fellow deliberate practice researchers were very curious about what distinguished the professionals that got stuck in arrested development and really didn't get much better over time. And those that actually progressively did get better, more effective and actually reached expertise, let's call it, in their chosen field. Now, this is an image that I like quite a, quite a lot. So this is the arabesque. Uh, for you interested in dance out there. Now you'll see, this is a very interesting thing. This is the standard for training in the arabesque across different decades. So you'll see in 1962 that this was what was asked of uh, trainees to be able to do uh, in terms of the arabesque. Now notice that over time, the standard for what was required for that chosen skill actually steadily increased over the decades. So by the time we're in 2003, 
you were expected to be able to do this, this, uh, what seems to me impossible, but clearly not impossible arabesque. Now we might ask ourselves, did people's uh, legs change dramatically over the span of 40 years? And to my knowledge, that's not the case. What really changed is the methods of training. So has professional fields progress, one thing that distinguishes the, the progression of a field is them getting reliably better at how to train, at methods to train their trainees. So the better and the more nuanced you get into tailoring the type of training and finding principles of effective training, of course, the more you can ask of your trainees over time. Now in my own field, for example, my parallel field of music, it's very interesting historically that about in the 18th century, there was a, a spike of experts in music that happened. So all of a sudden, in, from the 18th to 19th century, all of a sudden, there was a spike in people who could actually perform a lot better technically. And the reason for that, it, it was because that was the century in, in which was the publication of the first music manuals, so training manuals. So once you have actually a reliable training uh, methodology that you can do repeatedly, get feedback on, then it's much easier to progress reliably over time. Our field has had quite a bit of trouble with this specific kind of methodology, like how, what really are the principles to help our trainees get reliably better over time? How can we tailor training to the specific trainee so that instead of it being a shameful or self-critical experience or just anxiety producing experience, uh, I'm sure, you know, probably for all of you, it was never anxiety producing, but you know, for me, it was at times quite anxiety producing to be a trainee in psychotherapy, not really understanding how to get better. So that's where the little practice might be of help and the principles that these researchers found that really seem to reliably help people get better. So without further ado, what, is, what makes the little practice different? The first really core difference is that deliberate practice is not performance. I'm gonna say that again. Deliberate practice is not performance. So this goes back to, if you just look at the years of experience performing the task, right? That doesn't really get you better over time. It would be like saying for you to be a master basketball player, you don't have to go to practice. You just got to show up for the NBA games, right? Or if you want to get really good at piano, you just show up for the concert in the Royal Albert Hall, right? What we're seeing is that people actually get better by what they do outside of the performance space, right? Now, this is quite a culture shift for psychotherapy, because in our history of psychotherapy, we have uh, this unspoken assumption in a way, or sometimes a spoken assumption, that the more therapy you do with actual clients, the more, of course, you should get better. You should more reliably be more effective. Now, in this deliberate practice lens, it's actually what you do outside of the therapy session that would make the most difference in order to really affect your performance. So in other words, we're not really trying to get even more out of the session itself because, you know, poor us, poor me, poor trainees that are already multitasking when they're in front of a client. So it's really what you do outside of the session and how you're able to prepare that really would make a difference. Now, if you only take one slide for this initial, you know, more didactic piece, this is it. And you are going to get these slides. I think you actually, I think Tracy has already sent out the slides, but they will also be available for those that might not have gotten these slides. This is a, a summary of the five core principles uh, coming from the little practice research and that apply actually for any profession in order to get reliably more effective over time. And these can be applied also to psychotherapy. So let me go over these five very quickly. So the first principle in actually getting better at anything, let's say, is that you actually observe your performance. So if, for example, you want to get better at piano, you have someone actually watch you play piano, or you record yourself playing the piano and show the recording to someone. Now, right here, we already have a split community in the psychotherapy field. 
Because it's true that quite a, a percentage of trainees are required to videotape or audio tape their sessions, but that's not at all mandatory. And a lot of uh, the feedback that we get is actually not on observed performance. So this would be kind of like sticking with this first observed performance. Imagine if you're uh, training to be a painter and you go up to your painting teacher and you say, I really want to get better at painting. And so your teacher says, great. And so you say, okay, so I have this painting. I really want to perfect this painting I have. I say, okay, great. Okay, so I did some blues here and then I did some yellows here and I did some straight lines. Okay, what should I do with this painting? Quite probably, hopefully, let's say, your teacher would say, I really got to see the painting. Same thing with any other profession. And you'll see actually in many professions in sports, for example, the importance of actually seeing observed performance is paramount. Said in other words, we don't trust self-report. Now, that's not because us as therapists, you know, are particularly uh, ashamed of our performance. You know, we have a lot going on when we're actually performing, but we have a lot of research that there's actually a very... Um, that our self-report of what we do in session is not the best. There's a lot of memory gaps. Uh, and then we don't notice a lot of things that we do in session that we could get feedback on. So in our own field, imagine that you go to your supervisor and you ask for help with a particular client. It will be very hard for you to get feedback on your performance because your self-reported performance is, of course, very biased. So, again, first principle is having a way to have your uh, work really observed in order to get better. That would mean in our field basically two or three things, which is videotaping your work or audio taping your work so that you actually have the performance at hand or doing role plays in vivo so that you can get that feedback from the observed performance in vivo from the role play. Then, second core principle in the little practice is getting expert feedback. Now. In our field of psychotherapy, we actually have a profession for this. It's called supervision. And it's a wonderful thing because, uh, as you fellow SEPI friends know, our field can be quite split off across models and different approaches. But actually, supervision is one, if not the only thing that we agree across different models that is of paramount importance. I have not met a person from any model who says that supervision doesn't matter. Now, what the little practice research comes in to help is that it tells us that the expert feedback should be based on the observed performance, meaning it's quite different to get feedback just based on self-report of the trainee or the therapist or actually getting feedback from watching you perform from the videotape or from the role play. Then, based on that expert feedback you get on your observed performance, you can establish small learning goals. And we say small uh, very consciously because our field loves big, generic, you know, broad terms. For example, you just need to have a better therapeutic alliance or relationship with this client, which of course is a wonderful thing to have. And most trainees will say, yes, I agree. How do I do that? Right? So that's where the small learning goals come in. And this is, has actually from my work with Tony in this book series and with the colleagues from different models, this has been universally one of the toughest points is really synthesizing these wonderful concepts and, uh, and skills into action, actionable, concrete learning goals. So instead of just talking, yeah, you've got to have a better therapeutic alliance, you've got to really nail down to can you sustain uh, enough capacity to have a goal setting question with this client. How would you do it explicitly? And then here's the last really important piece, actually try it out. And that's where we get to the behavior rehearsal. So the little practice is quite an experiential approach, meaning it's not fair game to just talk about it. That would be like going to the gym, seeing other people uh, doing the lifts, the weights, and you're saying, yeah, I'm also, you know, I'm at the gym, so of course I'm also building muscle. Unfortunately, we can't just watch people do something or do the skill. We actually have to behaviorally rehearse the skill. So again, briefly, 
we have to observe your R performance. Based on that observed performance, get feedback on it from a coach or from actually objective measures. There's many different ways to get this feedback on the observed performance. Based on that, establish small learning goals. Okay, what do I want to try to do a little bit better? Find ways to train that in specific exercises or deliberate practice exercises. And then behaviorally rehearse repeatedly those exercises that are tailored to your specific capacity. So this is really very important, is that deliberate practice is an end of one practice. It really just focuses on where you are specifically in your own threshold and capacity. And we try to find ways to work on your capacity with specific skills tailored to you. Lastly, as you're trying out, for example, trying out a skill uh, during role play or trying saying the skill to a video of your client, then we assess your performance over time. In our case of psychotherapy, we would assess performance. Are you actually reliably getting better at the skill? And if not, we tailor the exercise to make it more effective. And at the global scale, are you getting more effective as a therapist? As you can see, career long repetition. So basically, the more you do these five principles, the more probable it is that we'll get more reliably better over time in our profession. One last piece, so I've just synthesized the main concepts and principles of the lower practice. Just one last piece that's quite important has to do with tailoring the difficulty to the trainee's specific capacity. And I say trainees, but honestly, every one of us, right? Therapists. Is that... And you might recognize this from uh, the zone of proximal development theory, is that we actually only really learn in a very specific difficulty range. So if an exercise we're practicing is too easy, we're not really learning anything new. It just becomes boring, we want to drop it, or we feel really good about ourselves because we can do it, but we're not actually practicing to get better at it. So for example, if I'm really good at the scale and the piano, I'm not getting reliably better at the piano by practicing always the same easy scale. I have to do something that's in the challenging but not overwhelming range. And that's really the deliberate practice sweet spot. This, let's say if it's on the emojis from zero to 10, this kind of four to eight, five to eight range, this is where the money is at. This is really the zone where the more you can stay here, doing exercises that are challenging for you specifically, but don't feel overwhelming, then it's more probable that you'll get more reliably better over time. Now, just one note on self-compassion here for trainees and for us at large, is that a lot of our research, if it's not tailored to our own personal capacity, can very easily feel overwhelming. Meaning, if we're asked to practice something or to just look at something that is really outside of our capacity completely, so on the 8, 9, 10 range of hardness, the more probable outcome is not that I'll learn anything, it's just that I'll feel shame and be self-critical and want to give up. So for example, I remember with my piano teacher, uh, I wanted to play a very hard piece and there was a specific piece that I really loved that I really wanted to play. And of course, I always failed in the first five seconds of trying to play it. It was totally outside of my range of development. I got self-critical, tried again, and I just, just got more frustrated. And my teacher was like, of course, if you want to play that, you've got to start here. Start with the other challenging stuff that is challenging, but not overwhelming right now. So what we want to do is actually try to do a bunch of uh, methods to actually apply these principles to psychotherapy so that people can actually feel that, which is quite gratifying, I think, feel that they actually can get reliably better over time. Okay, time. I think I was able to, Tony, you let me know. This was like kind of the summary of the principles. Did great. <laughs> You, you awesome. did great. I've been answering questions uh, in the Q&A. Thank you, everyone. We've gotten some really great questions. Oh, cool. Uh, you know, this, this topic raises a lot of questions. Um, and so please, you know, let them rip in the Q&A. Uh, and while, you know, and Alex can maybe monitor that while I'm doing the exercises.
Yeah, we're uh, in tag team mode today. So Tony is now going to take the lead and I'm going to keep answering questions. Yes, great. Uh, thank you, Alex. Great. So we're, let me share my screen um, here. One second. Okay, Alex. And please tell me if... Uh, yep. Sing it. Okay, great. I just have to go ahead. One second, guys. All right, so we're gonna jump in and try an exercise right here, all of us together. Um, so this exercise is called Empathic Understanding. This comes from uh, the first book in our series, The Essentials of Deliver Practice, uh, which focuses on emotion-focused therapy. Uh, Rhonda Goldman is the lead author on it, and this is one of the first skills that she selected as essential for uh, uh, therapists who are learning the EFT model. And this, this skill, like most of the skills, frankly, all the skills in the book apply to therapists across all models. <laughs> so really, uh, the, these are all common factor skills. Uh, the models are just a way of kind of operationalizing them, explaining them in the context of a theory that makes sense to the clients and the therapist. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you a video clip of an actor playing a mock client. And uh, the you'll, you'll notice we've actually created, Alex created videos of actors playing clients who are receiving Zoom therapy during this whole COVID crisis thing. Um, I'm sure many people here joining us today are doing therapy via Zoom as I am. Um, and the client is gonna be expressing some distress and various things. And your task is, you have two skill criteria, two tasks listed on the screen. First, uh, we want you to accurately capture and reflect back the core meaning and feeling behind the client's statements. And then we want you to do it in a tentative exploratory tone, okay? Now we're not gonna hear you do it, so you get to just do it to the screen. So you can say whatever you want, no fear of judgment. Uh, we recommend you wait until the video ends. I think the video is about a minute, is that right, Alex? Yep. Okay, um, and then we'll, we'll talk about it afterwards as well. So. Uh, here, here we go. If you have any questions about it, ask in the Q&A. So put on your empathic face for your client. And, and let's see, Alex, tell me if you hear the volume, okay? Yeah. Yes. I've been binge watching Netflix for weeks now. Oops. Sorry, Tony. It, it is not yeah, playing. It's blocked. Yep. Person. Whoops. Okay, okay now it's gone. So maybe go it. from the from yeah. the top. Yeah. I've been binge watching Netflix for weeks now. At first, I thought I'd be super productive during this current time, but I guess I was just pulling myself. Every day just feels exactly the same. I haven't gotten any work done and never feel like even trying. I'm on a constant loop between eating, watching series, and sleeping. Great. All right, everyone. So now say to the client how you would express empathic understanding as if this was a real session right now. And we'll give you a minute. And if anyone wants to try typing what they would say, you could type it as a question in the Q&A. We could see some examples. But I, I want to emphasize that it's important to not just think what you could, what you would say, but to actually say it out loud.
one of the primary principles of deliberate practice is behavioral rehearsal in a stimuli environment that simulates what the actual work performance is going to be in. So we, we got something uh, close to what we call state dependent learning. The video of the client is uh, a stimulus that's producing a, an emotional reaction that we would have with a real client. Right, so Leon said, you're having a tough time with the quarantine, great. Uh, I'll be quiet and I'll let people practice the skill. All right, great, excellent. Now, Alex, we said we were going to repeat this one, right? Yeah, so just to give a sense of actual behavioral rehearsal. Yeah. Let's try it again. Great. So a lot of, of people, when they, you know, when they hear about deliberate practice, they're like, oh, yeah, I've been doing this for, you know, decades. We do role plays all the time in supervision. And, you know, that's great. Typically, role plays done in supervision or training, you kind of start a session and then you just kind of keep going for like 10 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. And that's kind of like a scrimmage of in a athletic practice where you're just kind of getting a lot of experience doing different things. With deliberate practice, we actually want to repeat the same basic skill again and again and again. So you can try different ways of responding. You can kind of flush out mistakes. You can experiment. You can see how it feels. You can do all those things. So we're going to repeat this skill now by watching the video again, and I'll be better about keeping my mouth shut, and you can uh, reply to the video. I've been binge-watching Netflix for weeks now. At first, I thought I'd be super productive during this quarantine, but I guess I was just fooling myself. Every day just feels exactly the same. I haven't gotten any work done. I never feel like even trying. I'm on a constant loop between eating, watching series, and sleeping. Great. Now re respond to the client again with empathic understanding and try to use different words than you did last time. Great. Now, if you look through the Q&A, you'll see all different kinds of uh, responses there. And they, I'm just looking through them very briefly, but they, you know, they look good to me. You know, just, you know uh, therapy is an improvisational art. There are, limit, uh, there are literally infinite numbers of uh, responses you could give to this client. And one of the concerns about deliberate practice is, oh, it's going to turn me into like a robot to always respond the same way. And it's exactly the opposite. We're actually using repeated behavioral rehearsal to help trainees experiment with a broad range of responses to increase their range. So when they're sitting with a client, they feel more confident in terms of, because they've already explored their personal style. What, what kind of responses feel good to them and which don't? Okay. So what we're gonna do now is a difficulty assessment where if you could just personally assess for yourself how challenging it felt to do this exercise on a scale of zero to 10. And we we're going to have people put this in the Q&A. Is that right, Alex? Yes. So if whoever wants to put from one to zero to 10, how challenging that felt. To actually in a fluent way, actually say to the screen, how fluently did you feel actually doing the intervention? 
Now, of course, this is subjective. Uh, if a supervisor is with you, the supervisor might say, you know, you didn't do it right, or you could have done it better this way or that way. There's our feedback is a very important part of the deliver practice process. And of course, we can't do that right now. Um, so we're just assessing your subjective sense of difficulty, which is still very, very important. Now, good, I'm seeing a good range of, uh, of difficulties there. Now, if you rated the difficulty as a four or lower, it might suggest that this exercise is too easy. Now that might be because uh, just the skill itself, empathic understanding is not you know, super hard for you, or it could very also likely be that this client is not uh, activating or mobilizing enough for you so that it's hard to express empathic understanding, right? So we would, uh, if that was the case, the supervisor or coach would pick a video that's more challenging or find a way to make the exercise more challenging. Likewise, if you rated the difficulty as an eight or higher, it would suggest that this exercise might be too challenging for you, that you might be too activated. Now, I can tell you from my own experiences in training, there was a fair amount of time when I was just overstimulated. I was overactivated while doing role plays. And I tried to hide it because I didn't think I was supposed to be. I thought there was something wrong with me. But since I found out that that happens all the time in training, we're just not used to thinking about it, which is kind of funny because it's one of our primary tasks as therapists is to see if our client is overactivated, right? Like every therapy model is thinking about that, right? But we typically aren't thinking about our trainees, over their you know capacity threshold, or are they overactivated? So this is uh, a, a kind of a culture change that we are encouraging in the field of psychotherapy to really uh, craft each exercise and guide it towards the individual skill threshold of each trainee. Great. So now I'm going to ask you to look at the. Uh, reactions at the bottom of the screen and see if you notice any of the thoughts, emotions, body reactions, or urges in each category. If you do, that suggests that it's either a good challenge or too hard. If you don't notice any of these, it suggests that it might be too easy. I'll leave this up for uh, another minute. Now, this is the DP reaction form uh, that was sent out beforehand. And this is uh, available for free on our website. And you're welcome to, to use it however you want uh, in your own training or research or presentations or, or what have you. So I'm going to move on here. And great. So. We're gonna tailor the difficulty of the exercises. Uh, if an exercise is too challenging, we're gonna focus on fewer skill criteria. We're gonna make it more simple, right? We're also gonna adjust the difficulty of the video to make the, the uh, evocativeness of the video to make it simpler. If the exercise is challenging, but not too hard, not too easy, we'll repeat it. And if it was too easy, we're gonna make it harder. All right, let's go ahead and do another exercise here. Anything you'd like to add first, Alex? Uh, just to don't, I want to, to undo your own wellness, Tony, and say I can remember many times where I felt completely over threshold in my own training. And still to this day, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, look, it's the nature of psychotherapy that we are asked to sit with clients who are experiencing very high levels of distress and we're asked to attune with them, which means connecting with them, feeling their distress. And we are not allowed to just do whatever we can to like make it stop, right? Like every other profession just gets to make it stop, you know, like give them meds or, you know, get them out of there or, you know, somehow save them. Well, our job is to sit there with them in that distress for, I mean, months or years sometimes. Um, and so it's, a, it's important that we gradually build that capacity and not kind of do it all at once. Um, 
Okay. Oh, someone, uh, uh, someone asked about, uh, they said, I hope diarrhea isn't that common when you guys present on this. So this is often surprising for people that uh, all the reactions on the reaction form, right? Let me, let me go back to the reaction form here. Diarrhea is down here. So the, these reactions are uh, the, when the trainee's parasympathetic nervous system is overloaded and activated. And uh, I have definitely uh, seen that experience. I myself have had almost every experience on this page in different, in different forms of training, different kinds of training. Uh, the thing is, is trainees are often very good at hiding it. So you might not, you know, they, they just, they want you to approve of them. They want to pass, they, they want a plus. So they, they'll sit there and nod their head, but they might be actually having a lot of distress internally. So it's worth asking and kind of normalizing a whole range of experiences they can have. Um, Al, should we answer questions or should we do another exercise here? So it's funny because I'm, I'm there, we have a lot of great questions already. I just answered uh, one here. Okay, so, great answering them. Yeah. Uh, keep answering him. So maybe I'll just read out loud one here that I okay. still haven't answered. How does a supervising trainee determine optimal responses for a given skill? I like that the trainee is encouraged to maintain some spontaneity, but I have wondered how the trainee and supervisor would describe and define the parameters of an optimal response. Are those parameters discussed prior to the practice or do they emerge after repeated practice sessions? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, of course, there's tremendous debate in psychotherapy about what is the optimal response. Like our field has not reached consensus on that. And that's what something that makes psych uh, deliver practice for psychotherapy a lot harder than deliver practice for like basketball or chess or whatever. Because in, you know, in those fields, you can tell, did you win the game or did you lose? Like, it's really simple. Psychotherapy is a lot more complex, a lot more nuanced. Um, I would define it ultimately as the optimal response is the one that helps the client the best. And you won't know that until you're sitting with the client. Now, the supervisor or coach can kind of, you know, hopefully guide you in that direction. Uh, but I would actually... I, I would veer away from looking for the, like the optimal or best response because I don't think psychotherapy is really good for that. I would look for a range of responses that feel congruent to the trainee, that feel authentic to the trainee, and that hopefully will connect with the client and provide the client with some, um, some connection and some help. Um, but that's kind of a work in progress. What would you say, Alex? I would, yeah, totally agree. And I would add that, you know, given our, we still, of course, do have some good process research and another tying this with another question that showed up, we can also use objective measures like process measures to really kind of get a sense of how our performance is going. So there are some wonderful empathy measures, alliance focus measures that give some sense of criteria. But it really talks, Jonathan, to your question is really great because it really ties into something important that we found as we tested out many different skills in different countries uh, because of our book series, which is the, the importance of the skill criteria. So we did a mistake at first of really like having example responses for the stimuli that we provided. And while it's totally okay to give example responses, that could give the impression that the responses were perfect or that's what you should be answering. When actually what's really most important in the skill is having skill criteria, meaning what's the general gist of what you're really trying to get across. So if you want to create a dual practice exercise, I would suggest just try to nail down specifically the criteria that you're aiming towards. Yeah, so it's not about the perfect response. It's more what is the function of the skill, right? So in this case, the function of the skill is for the client to feel uh, empathically understood. And there are, uh, you know, there's a thousand different ways of doing that. Each therapist is going to have their own way of doing that. Uh, Jim asked a, a great question here about how can practicing help more complex skills? Uh, and I would uh, draw the metaphor for uh, like jazz, uh, where a jazz performance, every jazz performance is unique and different and improvised. It's very complex. But jazz performers practice, they rehearse the same core basic skills. And they rehearse them a lot. <laughs> they don't just rehearse them for like a week or two or a month or two. They rehearse their whole life, right? Especially the professionals. And the reason is, is that 
ha you know, when they perform jazz, they don't just get up there and do whatever they want. They have a, a common set of core skills that they've mastered. And those skills are just so baked in. They feel so fluent and confident in those skills. They don't have to think about those skills. And that then, look, that then lets them put together uh, a very complex improvised performance uh, in front of the audience. Um, let's see, another question here. Shri said, helps the client the best can be very subjective. May I add that discussing what is optimal, what helps the client the best is very helpful for supervisor and trainee. Yeah, it, I, I'd, I'd agree it is subjective. And, and what we don't want to do is be reductionist. What we don't want to do is oversimplify therapy, right? That would be a mistake. What we do want to do is try to break training into as small steps as possible. All right, those are often confused. All right, when a supervisor says to a trainee, when a trainee says, how do I express you know, empathy? And if the supervisor says, oh, it's infinitely complex, that might be true, but it's also not helpful to the training. Right, what the supervisor should be saying were, here's a series of exercises so you can practice expressing empathy, and over time, you will build an infinitely com complex uh, range of responses. Yeah, one more question, by the way, Tony, if you want to chime Which in. Which one? The last one by Melon Force. Great. Uh, last question, I feel confused. I think the most difficult thing with psychotherapy is to assess what to do in a certain situation, not to perform the action itself. For example, the difficulty is to assess whether to, for example, validate, challenge, or interpret defenses. Great. So this, this is a really great question. Uh, and we've got three experts, uh, one of whom is here, Hannah Levinson, uh, working on this exact question. For They're doing the uh, psychodynamic book for our series, uh, which we're very excited about. Um, and uh, Could you maybe I, stop sharing the screen, Tony, for this section? Yeah. I can I can stop share here. So um, now, when you say the most difficult thing with therapy, uh, I would say yes. What you're talking about is very 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 difficult, um, and is very important. Um, however, if you ask many trainees, uh, they will say, "What I really want help with, especially out of the gate, is what do I say to the client." Right. Now, of course, ultimately, the therapist has to do both. They have to know how to engage the client and how to do a, a kind of case conceptualization assessment, you know, that, that kind of thing in their mind. There's both processes simultaneously. But if all we do is focus on the internal assessment and we haven't helped them uh, interact with the client, we're not really being congruent with what the trainee needs at that time. Like, really, it's kind of one and then the other and then one and then the other and one and then the other. And we found some models of therapy, in fact, many models of therapy have been really good at teaching how to think about clients, how to discuss clients, how to write about cases. I got really good at writing therapy. <laughs> I can talk really good therapy. I can debate really good therapy. But if you watch a video of my therapy session, what I'm actually saying to my client it might be something very different. Where what I really, my, my ability to conceptualize cases got way higher than my ability to actually use that conceptualization interpersonally with the client, right? And so that's where we're making sure to provide enough guidance is what do I say to the client? How am I using that? And then ultimately, how do I integrate these skills and do them at the same time? I hope that makes sense. Um, I'd like to go and do another uh, exercise here. So let me, okay, great. So we're gonna move on. These are great questions, keep them coming. Uh, we're, we're gonna do another exercise. This one is on repairing alliance ruptures. And hold on one second here. All right, so two skill criteria here. The first one is, first, you validate the client's concern in an authentic manner. And second, you're gonna invite collaborative exploration to address their concern. All right, here we go. Look, 
I I don't want to be rude, but I'm just I'm not sure that therapy is helping. Now I I I felt better when we started a few months ago, but now I just you know, I feel worse. And I know that you're trying, but do you, do you really think that this is helping? And how do, how do you know for sure? Great. Now, I'm going to go back to the skill criteria so you can see it. First, you validate their concern in an authentic manner and then you invite collaborative exploration. And let me go back to the picture here so you can see the, the gentleman here. So go for it. Alex, we can't hear you. I'm actually practicing. Oh. Great, if anyone wants to type uh, their response in the screen or in the Q&A, please uh, do so. And uh, I, Alex, why don't we repeat this one? How, how about it? Let's repeat it. Okay, everyone, you're gonna get a second chance at it. Look, I, I don't wanna be rude. But I'm just, I'm not sure that therapy is helping. Now, I, I, I felt better when we started a few months ago, but now I just, you know, I feel worse. And I know that you're trying, but do you, do you really think that this is helping? And how, how do you know for sure? Great, go for it. Great. So we, we had some good examples here in the Q&A. Uh, now, if we are doing a real deliberate practice session, we would rehearse this skill, uh, I, I mean, at least 10 times, probably 20, 30, you know, we, we would keep going. And we'd be trying to make it easier or harder, depending on how you rated the difficulty. We had a great question here. Uh, both of these initial exercises seem to refer to intuitive judgments by the therapist. Do you think these judgments are teachable or are they basic qualities that one has to have to become a therapist? I mean, this is the kind of nature nurture question, right? And I mean, that's a, it's a great uh, topic for research. I don't think there's research on that yet. Uh, if you wanted to do that research, I would strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, what we're hoping is, I mean, I'm sure there's some people that are just not really, that just can't be therapists. You know, that's okay. Like, I could never be a ballerina. Like, that's okay. Like, I could do 20 years of ballerina. I just couldn't do it. Like, that's okay. Like, um, but what we're hoping to do with deliberate practice is increase the range on the bell curve of people who can become very effective therapists. Because I worry that right now that range is kind of tight and restricted to people who are just kind of naturally talented or gifted at it, right? Which used to be the case with many other fields. It's a great question. Um, great, we got a bunch of great uh, responses. What you're seeing in here is the range of uh, responses that, that can be given. And this is the goal, is to kind of flush out, to experiment, to try on, you know, new response modes. So, excellent. So what we're gonna do here, again, if you could uh, write down, and if you feel up to it, type it in the Q&A, how difficult this exercise felt. Now you could also look down at the reactions and see if you noticed any reactions in the good challenge or any in the too hard.
I think a, a fair amount of people, some people are saying this one felt a little more challenging than the first one. That, that's, it's fairly common, though I want to say uh, one of the most uh, reliable experiences we have teaching deliver practice with these videos to audiences around the world is that there's a broad range of reactions within any given audience. Typically, a third of the people will say it's too easy, a third will say it's, it's a good difficulty, and a third will say it's too hard. Now, of course, that has to do with your personal skill level, your counter-transference, your experiential avoidance, your personal history, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so this really underlines how important it is for the supervisor or coach to be continually assessing how challenging exercises are for trainees. Okay, let's do a third one here. Whoops. Are we doing the same exercise on this one? Same exercise. Okay, same exercise on this one. Here we go. I know that before this whole COVID thing happened, we were working on my relationship with my parents. But honestly, now that I'm stuck at home and I'm not even seeing anyone anymore, I just don't feel that focusing on that makes any sense anymore. It's like all we were working on before has to be put on hold. I just don't see the point of digging deep into my emotions when all this other stuff is happening right now. And stuff that has such a bigger impact in my life right now. Great. Your turn. Go for it. Great, excellent. So again, whoops, note how difficult this one felt. And if, if you feel comfortable doing so, put it in the Q&A. Scale zero to 10. And you can also note what reactions you had. What many people will notice is that the same skill or same exercise felt either easier, the same or harder with a different video. Right. This is our goal is to give trainees exposure to as broad a range of client presentations as possible. I mean, ideally before they're seeing clients, though that's not always possible. Great. So uh, something we want to touch on here. Do we have the flirty woman one, Alex? Oh, yeah, we do. Is that? It's coming up next. Oh, that's coming this. up. Okay, great. Excellent. Great. So something else we focus on is using deliberate practice to help trainees build awareness of their inner process while they're doing therapy. Now, basically, every model of therapy says this is important. The therapists should stay self-aware. Uh, they should be able to self-regulate any reactions they have so they can better attune with the client, right? Unfortunately, most models of therapy have not provided instructions on how trainees are supposed to achieve that, <laughs> right? So that's something we're trying to do is, besides go do your own therapy, which is, which is great. I think trainees should definitely do their own therapy. Uh, but uh, ideally, it would also be built into training in a way that respects trainees' boundaries. And so what we've been experimenting with is how can we use deliberate practice to help trainees uh, build their self-awareness, build their mindfulness, uh, build their self-reflective capacity. Uh, and so to do this, we use videos that are uh, evocative, and we ask the trainees to uh, just try to notice uh, their internal experience. So here we go, one second. What we're gonna do here is for this exercise, this exercise is on setting boundaries. 
The skill criteria is to clarify an appropriate therapy boundary. However, what we're also going to do, there's kind of a secret second skill, which is for you to be self-aware of your internal process, your internal reaction while the client is talking. So we're, there, we're, in, we're uh, practicing multitasking here. This goes back to the question that was asked earlier, the really important question about, oh, shouldn't the therapist be thinking about, you know, the kind of conceptualization of the client? It's true. The therapist should also be self-aware of what was going on. So we're uh, helping practice multitasking. So here we go. I want you to know that you've been very helpful to me. We have only been meeting for a few weeks and you've helped me way more than my previous therapists. How do you understand me so well? It's like you can read my mind. You're very insightful. What I'm thinking about right now. It's a shame that I met you as my therapist. Because you're the kind of person I've been looking for as a partner. Sometimes I wonder what it would be like if we were together. The other night I hooked up with a girl I met at a bar. And when we were together, I thought about you. I hope you don't judge me for thinking about you. And I know you have to be professional, but sometimes I wonder if you think about me too. I know you can't answer me that, and that's okay. Because honestly, it's more fun having a secret, isn't it? All right, so go ahead and uh, how would you clarify boundaries with this client? Great. Now, how difficult did people find it to do that exercise? And I would say difficult to not just respond to the client, but also track your inner experience as the video was playing. Yeah, it's harder. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first time something like this happened when I was a trainee and I was like, oh my God, I just like totally froze and pretended the client didn't say anything. And uh, that was not the right response. Um, and I didn't tell my supervisor because I was terrified and that also was a mistake. Um, and ideally I would have been able to practice this beforehand. So I would have been a little more prepared uh, for, you know, this someone put 20. <laughs> So just so, to join in with Tony here, this uh, was, was with Portuguese actors that we filmed this, and this is actually almost verbatim from a case that I had as well. <laughs> so I can definitely remember totally freezing and going into pretend <laughs> boundary setting mode. <laughs> from the outside, it must just seem just total chaos mode. Yeah. I wish so, I would have had this to practice. All right, Alex. So we're, we're, uh, we're getting, I think we got uh, 15 minutes or so left. So let, let's switch back to you, Alex. Okay, I'm going to stop the screen share. Okay. So if you can also keep an eye on the q and I will. So this was like a good representation, I hope, of like some little practice exercises. Now, it's very important to say that these are what we can call kind of generic exercises, meaning that, you know, any trainee might potentially benefit from them, or trainee or therapist, of course. 
But in normal dual practice coaching, what you do would be actually looking at your specific cases, your specific performance, and really tailor specific exercises to you. Now, what happens is that for a lot of cases, uh, trainees have never seen um, the, the client before, a client before. So it might, oh, someone is saying that I am not, not on the screen. Whoops. Why is that? Mm. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> um, thank you for people who pointed that out. Um, so, for you know, this is very relevant for trainees who have never seen a client in their life. Is that dual practice can also apply to them, right? So, if you have these kind of videos, and here's the great news: we are going to leave kind of to the end, but I'm going to say it like the spoiler alert: is every single video you just saw is actually totally for free. It's up on our website, you know, and we hope to create a lot more free video content that you can use for your own benefit and with your students and for yourself. So every one of these skills that we just practiced today, you can look on online and have fun with them. So let's tie in all that we've been talking about. And I'm going to go back here to our slides. So, Anton, you might let me know. Can you see... The, my screen yeah great okay so dual practice in psychotherapy is a very recent topic there's a lot of questions still to be answered and you know we don't pretend at all that we have things figured out quite the contrary <laughs> um there's a lot of great research happening but that still needs to happen the first major publication on dual practice for psychotherapists was by our colleague daryl chow in 2015 where he showed that uh, in a retrospective study that therapists that seem to do more of the activities related to the lower practice seem to have the best outcomes out of a larger sample. So that was a nice first study on the topic. Since then, uh, as you can see, we created this table with uh, publications that have been made in recent years on the lower practice in psychotherapy. Now on our website, which is dp4therapists.com, uh, we have a section there on the resources page that we periodically update with all of the studies on the lower practice for psychotherapy. And we leave downloadable copies of every of those studies. So if you're curious in really delving into the research that's coming out, you can go to dp4therapist.com and you can have fun reading all of the papers that are listed here. I'm just going to give you kind of the bottom line that's been coming up from these studies. Oh, and also just mentioned shortly, what's been really interesting is that Tony and I now in our peer review hat, we're basically full with just reviewing papers on deliver practice because in the past year or so, there's actually been a small boom in people interested in doing research, which is wonderful. So now we have like a dozen papers like being made or studies in development in deliver practice for psychotherapy. So we would expect a lot more good stuff coming out in the recent uh, future, near future. So the preliminary main takeaways of these studies that I just listed out before is that in general, the DP groups seem to outperform control groups when you have any kind of skills development workshop. Uh, and this is blindly rated with observer measures. So if you have, for example, there's a very recent study by Henny Westra as an example for motivational interviewing skills, a uh, randomized trial where a group of uh, trainees was in a dual practice workshop versus control workshop, which was purely didactic, just talking about the skills. It seems that then when they actually observed the performance and rated that performance, the, the DP group got steadily better over time. So that's a nice outcome that we're seeing across studies, recent studies. Also, the literature review that's coming out in training processes, and this isn't just from recent dual practice papers. This goes back to, for example, Clara Hill's uh, artic, uh, chapter I was telling you before, reviewing this kind of training and supervision research. It seems that what might be considered the least effective training for skills development, or at least, and also correlating with uh, better alliances and outcomes is passive listening or didactic kind of training, which is, you know, by far what we have the most uh, across workshops, uh, across uh, our training centers and colleges. Now, we're not saying, of course, that didactic training is unimportant. Quite the contrary. It's very important. But there needs to be, a, it seems, a good balance between the didactic piece and the more experiential skills development piece. 
Also very consistently across these studies that the little practice is hard work. So it takes time to do it. It takes effort to do it. It takes motivation to do it because you're actually showing your work. You're getting feedback on it. You're trying something repeatedly. So, you know, it's a pain in the butt in a way. And it, you better also have a supportive environment that doesn't shame you for trying out something outside of your comfort zone. So it's quite hard to implement is what you're saying. And also back to the intra-personal piece, we also have a couple of studies and some other on the way that show that it seems that little practice might be helpful not just for the inter-personal skills piece, but also the intra, where trainees uh, seem to get better at increasing their awareness of their inner experience and be able to productively use that in a clinically helpful way. Now, Tony and I find it very important to give priority also to this topic and this slide, which is there are many concerns that research still needs to address regarding the little practice. And there's a recent wonderful paper by Clemens Hickman and Rees. And you can download this paper again on our website, which is basically a critique of the little practice, like what still needs to be figured out in the little practice. And it's really a, a great paper. So it's, it's well worth a read. Uh, and just to boil it down, the major concerns that research needs to address at this point is the idea that dual practice might be, unfortunately, a reductionistic approach, meaning if you're, if you're focusing on small learning goals, where yes, uh, the performance of dual practice is quite an ample improvisational aspect to it, how much is dual practice actually a reductionistic approach or how much can you actually build skills across time in order to make uh, some of the parts better than the whole? or the whole bear is some of the parts, sorry. The question of how to identify skills to practice. Now it's very important here to say that deliberate practice research tells us principles on how to practice more effectively. Deliberate practice research does not tell us what to practice, okay? So that's a very important distinction. The principles we talked about, observing performance, getting expert feedback, small learning goals, behavior rehearsal, and assessing performance are what was found to seem to help across professions to get better at what you're doing, but it doesn't really tell you the specific skill to focus on. Now, you might argue that in our field, we have a set of what you might call common factors that are generically therapeutic factors that we want to work on. For example, empath, empathy, uh, alliance-focused uh, interventions, getting feedback from client, managing counter-transference or experiential avoidance. So these are skills that through research we know are, kind, are somewhat related to outcomes. So these are probably good targets for practice. But those targets we can gauge through process outcome research. Deliberate practice research in and of itself, at least at this point, doesn't tell, us, doesn't tell us what skills to practice. Another maybe taboo question, but it's, it's an important one because we really don't have enough research to say anything about, is our therapist characteristics malleable? It goes back to someone's question before about like the nature and nurture question. We're kind of assuming in the lower practice, as with other professions, that you can get better over time. And that seems like a good bet, but we actually need a lot more research in showing that if you practice systematically in a flexible way and in a tuned way, that your characteristics are malleable enough that you get steadily better over time. Again, more research is needed. And lastly, the barriers for implementation. So let's assume that actually the practice seems to be helpful, at least in some cases. I would suggest as an adjunct to let's call it more traditional training and supervision. We're not saying that it should override any of the good things we already have. It's a good complement what we already have in our field. We still have the issue that implementing uh, this method of training, the little practice, is hard. There are barriers to it, just as there are barriers, for example, to do routine outcome monitoring. There are environmental factors, it takes time, therapists might be concerned about it and have some resistance to it. So there's still gonna be a lot of resistance to the actual implementation. And we have to take those seriously because of course this does take time and energy. So we wanna find better ways to help therapists use this in a way that feels helpful and seems helpful in the long run. Now, Tony, do you want to mention something here on our suggested resources? Sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, we got to wrap up here in just a minute. Um, and also, I just heard from Henny Westra, who is here with us live. We had a mistake Great. on our lit review. 
we said Henny et al. That was a mistake. It's actually Westra et al. She, uh, she's got a, a paper uh, in press, a great uh, controlled study on using deliver practice to help with MI related skills. Uh, that is has some really interesting results. So I really encourage everyone to see that. So uh, there's a bunch of different teams. Uh, experimenting with using deliver practice in different ways are listed here. Uh, I we don't have time to go through them all, but you've got them in the slides, and I encourage you to check them all uh, out. Alex, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, and these are four uh, common obstacles that we have found from uh, sites, training sites, where we have. Uh, gone and helped kind of experiment with how would you implement deliver practice. And we don't have time to go into these uh, in a lot of detail now. If you have questions about any of this, email us. We're very happy to dialogue about it. Uh, it'd be wonderful to do a panel at CEPI when we're all allowed to get back together in person where people could talk about their different experiences. Uh, we found some things have worked well, other things have not worked so well. It's been quite a rich uh, 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 field of findings. So. Um, and then uh, finally, we'd like to leave you with this. So uh, Alex and I have this website, Deliver Practice Institute, where uh, we have all these videos here, all the videos you saw today, plus a bunch more are available for free use in your own training. Um, and we have about short length, medium length, long length. We've got a bunch of the uh, slides, we've got some uh, videos of lectures, of live demonstrations, and we're just going to keep loading more material onto this website. So go ahead, use it. Uh, you're welcome to use the material from these slides in your own presentations, in your own teaching, you know, wh whatever you want. Uh, but what we would really encourage is, because we know a lot of researchers are joining us today, is we, if anyone is interested in doing research on deliver practice, we would really encourage you to do so. That's what we really need right now, is to figure out how is this best going to help psychotherapy, because we really are in a unique field. Um, so the metaphors to sports and music and all that are great, but they're limited, you know? They, they only go so far, and we kind of have to figure out how do we do this for psychotherapy. So... Um, I think that's it. Awesome. And we, we were able to stick to the plan. <laughs> Amazingly. <laughs> <laughs> so Tracy and Shigeru, if you want to also join in just for the kind of last piece here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I mean, you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing more developments in the future. It's already very exciting. You guys are connecting psychotherapy practice training and research. And it's all, you know, uh, researchers across different, um, you know, orientations are all interested. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>